I'm very excited to welcome our presenter, John Knight, who is going to talk to us about how to kickstart your business from someone who has done it all before. John is the Managing Director of Business Depot and is passionate about helping clients boost their profits and improve their future by breaking through those barriers to business success. Alrighty, I'm going to hand over to you now, John. Hello. Uh, so I think we're good to go. Um, so thank you for the introduction. And so yes, today's topic, um, everything you know you need to know. So it's all about if you want to start a business, um, how do you get started? What do you need to know from business strategy to back office? Um, we really, everything is relevant um, when, you, when you go out there to start a business. And, and, and a big part of what I do is about empowering the bright ideas of small to medium business owners and especially the entrepreneurial spirits out there. So, so a big part of what I want to achieve today for you is answer some questions for you along the lines of you don't know what you don't know. So there'll be things that you haven't even thought about in starting a business that I'd like to share with you and get you thinking about. And then there'll be other things that you know you need to know them already and I'd like to give some clarity around that for you as well. So my background, just by way of introduction, so that, um, so that you, you know where I'm coming from, is that um, I, I grew up in, um, in, in country Queensland and um, obviously I'm a, I'm a student of USQ myself and um, I went down the course of doing um, an accounting degree and, um, and ended up going down the, the route of professional accounting. Um, I did that for many years, equity partner within the accounting practice, but always had a focus a bit more on the business, on the business advising, on the business consulting side of things. And a couple of years ago, we set up Business Depot. So um, I can include some, some first-hand experience, I suppose, around setting up a business, setting up a new brand, um, and getting people to buy into what it is that, that we're trying to achieve. So at Business Depot, we're all about empowering the bright ideas. And we do that through collaboration. We do that through providing insights, experience, um, and also connecting you to the specialists that you know you need to know. Okay, I think I might be sharing the wrong screen, so just give me one second, guys. See if I can fix that. That's better. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so that's my background. And so what I want to share with you today um, is is really my tips, tips on what you need to do when you're starting a business, and then once you're running the business. Um, give you a heads up about the traps, and I suppose that's some of the lessons learned um, that I've had along the way with my own business and even with the businesses that we advise every single day um, of my working life. Um, some of the tricks along the way and some of the tidbits. So we'll be talking about tax, we'll be talking about tactics, and so it's it's everything to do with business. And, and although um, I'm accounting qualified, we very much get into the nitty gritty of business and very much get into the non-financial elements of business as well. So one of the first points I'd make is that many small businesses or many businesses when they get started tend to be family owned businesses. And one of my points there is just don't ignore that. Um, family businesses have some massive benefits in that you've got more people with a vested interest, more people with ownership, more people interested in what the final outcome is in, in, the, in the success of the business. So don't ignore that. It can be one of your biggest assets. But you've also got to make sure that you um, consider the personal considerations of it, the impact on the family. Um, I've seen many family businesses be the cause of, of, of much dysfunction within families as well. So what I suggest there is that any family businesses that get up and running, just acknowledge um, that it is a family business and that you need to keep that in mind in everything that you do. Um, like these monkeys on this screenshot here, you've got to look after each other. Um, but then every now and then, you know, sometimes you've got to have some hard discussions as well, um, even with family interests. So multiple people in multiple families in one business together can often cause some, some, some conflict, um, but it's also your biggest asset. Now, whenever I talk about business, I talk, I go back to right at the beginning of why does that business exist? And one of the key things you need to make sure you have, you need to make sure that you've, you've got something you're putting out there that is different. Um, when you look at growth, and many of you have probably studied the growth matrix, you can go out there and you can, you can um, expand your markets for your existing services, 
you can add new services to your existing markets or it can be a combination of all of the above. Now the easiest way for growth, they say, is expanded markets for existing services. Because if you have to go and learn new services and then apply them also to a new market, it can be incredibly difficult. But one of the key things is just make sure that what you're going out there with doesn't already have a saturated market for it. Make sure that you're going out there with something different. And so that's why we've got the elephant with the, with the butterfly wings there. It's, it's, it's a bit like the purple cow, which I'll talk about a little bit further later on. What are the reasons? Um, why, why are you different? Why will you stand out from the crowd? Because if you do stand out from the crowd, um, it will be, it, it'll be so much easier um, to market yourself um, and, and the overall business takes so, it's, it's so much easier to get penetration in what you're doing. Now I've just got a short video here I'm, I'm going to try and show and it just really reiterates this point. Now it's actually a plug for a book but the message I think is awesome for anyone who's going into business. Sorry about that, guys. So obviously that's a video, that's a bit of a plug for, for a book, but the message I think is, is absolutely critical, especially to people who are going out there to set up a new business. You need to make sure that what you're putting out there is different. It ties in somewhat to, um, to a book by the name of Purple Cow by Seth Godin. Um, and if anyone's ever read that book, um, it's an interesting take on the whole making sure that if you're a cow, if you're a purple cow out in the paddock, make sure that you're remarkable. Make sure that you're remembered. Um, because if you are remarkable, you will be remembered. And your whole marketing strategy, your whole business development strategy, your whole business can be driven from that core ingredient right at the beginning. Be different, be remarkable, and be remembered. Another point I'll just make there is, you know, in that video, you can see that there's a lot about, you know, saying no when everyone else is saying yes, or, or being small when everyone else is, is going big. 
And I think I refer to that as a strategic pendulum in that you'll see many businesses um, who go through their life cycle and then they go through the maturity. And if you've seen the life cycle of a business after maturity, you get declined. So the only way to stop that is to innovate and to change the business. And maybe it's to go against the grain. Um, it's maybe when everyone else is going one way, you go the other. And I think that's the important um, thing to keep in mind when you're setting up the business. Another key thing tied in with all of that is knowing what your sustainable competitive advantage is. And that's what your SCA is. The sustainable competitive advantage is what makes you stand out from the crowd. It also is something that provides value to the customer. So we'll have to do an exercise around sustainable competitive advantage. And, and where it starts is actually starts by putting yourself in the shoes of the customer. What does the customer place value on? And you start with that. It's not about what you think they place value on. You have to get to the nitty gritty of what does the customer place value on? You start with that and you think about, well, what's your ability to beat your competitors if you competed on the basis of that value proposition? So if you're a real estate agent and you go out there and you say that your competitive, that what the customers place value on is great customer service. Well, that's fine. But what are all your competitors saying as well? So if everyone else is saying exactly the same thing, maybe you need to change your message. Maybe your competitive advantage needs to be adjusted accordingly. The final component and probably the most important component of the sustainable competitive advantage is what we call internal impact. There's no point going out there and competing on a basis that doesn't drive your business, whether it be from a financial perspective, whether it be from an internal pride perspective. Um, if it doesn't drive you internally or doesn't drive the financial results that you want, then maybe that shouldn't be your competitive advantage. It has to be something that drives you internally as well. So know what your sustainable competitive advantage is. Often we'll complete a sustainable competitive advantage exercise with a statement and I call it the we will win statement. And your we will win statement always starts with those words. We will win by providing the best customer service within the Toowoomba region of whatever industry that, that you are in. Obviously you need to be more specific than that. But if you get a very clear we will win statement, then that can drive every decision you make within your business. If you then come to me and you say you want to buy a massive photocopier to do high quality printing, then I will then turn around and I will say, well, does that fit with your competitive advantage? If it does, then you do it. If it doesn't, then you reconsider it um, and it may not be an appropriate spend at that point in time. Tied into the whole um, where are we going, vision, mission, those types of things, I love the Jim Collins analogy of knowing what your BHAG is, your big, hairy, audacious goal. Now, if you're not in business yet, then this could be something that you want to work towards. This could be a personal BHAG rather than a business BHAG. But having a BHAG or having something to work towards, um, some big, bold vision, sometimes your BHAG, you know you'll never achieve it. But something that continually strives you. Now, I've seen BHAGs set by businesses where they've actually achieved it, thinking they wouldn't, and then they've had to move it out. They've had to do something else. So having a BHAG, that's probably one of my tips, knowing what it is that you're striving towards. Tied into that as well, you always hear people talking about mission or talking about purpose. Um, and it's tied into vision as well. But go back, I call it the why. So, so why do we exist? I think it's a Simon Sinek, um, Sinek um, analogy using the, the word why instead of purpose and mission. But why does the business exist? What is the purpose of the business? If you can ask yourself that and answer that, you can then instill that within your team. And if everyone has a very clear why, you can then apply that to the whole business and helps you just make sure everybody stays on track. Because when you're looking at that mission or when you're looking at that purpose, sometimes it's the little things that can make a difference and sometimes it's the bigger things. Yeah, sometimes the little things, like this is a photo in our boardroom where we have whiteboard paint on one of the walls. It's such a little thing but it's a part of how we are delivering on our why. So we want to be able to communicate accounting and business advice in the simplest possible way. We call it the no robotic mumbo jumbo. One way that we do that is instead of writing on our pads when we're trying to, trying to communicate to people, we get up and we draw on the wall. Now it's a big wall so we can fit a lot on it, but it creates an environment where you can communicate so much clearer and you can communicate so much better by people getting up and interacting within the communication as well. Well, like I said, sometimes it's the bigger things as well. 
So sometimes it's the things like thank you water, you know, why, um, why does this business exist? And more and more we're seeing these not-for-profit entities going into business with a bigger vision, a bigger mission, a bigger purpose, a bigger why. In this case, thank you water, it's um, providing water for, um, for, for um, areas in, um, in Asia or, and, and so forth. Because once you've got that clear, you then just have to drive your culture. And if your culture is strong, it will eat your strategy for breakfast. So what I mean by that is that if you've got the culture, your machine just works. It's like the oil within the machine. It just keeps it going. Um, you can have all the different strategies in the world, but if your culture is strong, it will continue to push that, that those strategies along for you. So this is sort of an, an all-encompassing thing, I suppose, because when you talk about culture, there's so many different, I suppose, thoughts come through your head as to what fits into culture. And uh, for me, culture is so much about the people. It, it sort of captures the values, the behaviours, the attitudes, the characters, and the why um, within your business. But more importantly, the people. I see, I see culture as very aligned with the, with, the, with the people element of your business. And that, I suppose, brings us to the, the old ad adage of um, everyone on the bus. Um, having a bus to get on is, is great to start with. You then got to get everyone on the bus. But not only that, you've got to have everyone facing the front as well. Be someone that will. You've got to have that leader in there as well. So this, I suppose, is more about team engagement. And so not only having a why, not only having um, clearly accepted behaviours and not accepted behaviours, having a clear purpose, you've then got to engage with people to get them on that way. Because um, if you don't, then then obviously you, you're, you're undermining the overall effectiveness of the business. Tied is all about keep it real, keep it authentic. Um, I see so many many businesses and business owners get out there and, and, and they're not being true to themselves. Um, I'm a strong believer in having absolute authenticity in what you do. Don't try and be something that you're not. Now, a business can be different to the individuals who create the business. But what I say here is don't, just, just remain authentic. Remain authentic in what you do. Um, and that, I suppose, ties into every part of your business as well, even your marketing collateral. Don't try and make these big statements if that's not who you are, if that's not who you want to be. Um, I just think um, you've got to have that authenticity or, or these days people see you through it because they can follow you, um, they can keep in touch with you and there's so many elements to the, to the community and the relationships that, that you're part of um, that there's no point in trying to be anything but authentic. Getting now to some of the more nitty gritty around tax and accounting and those types of things, one of the biggest things that I see people do wrong is when they start a business, they leave it too late to set up their structure. So you've got to, got to get the structure right from the beginning. Your plans can change, but you can plan for that change down the track. So all you can do is put the best thing in place, but what you anticipate will happen. So when I talk about structure, it is more than just the legal structure, but very importantly, we've got to get the legal structure right. And the sooner we do that, the better. Now the legal structure is the entity that carries on the business. Now so often I see people, they just start in their individual name and then they mosey on along and then all of a sudden they go, oops, we've got a business here. Um, now if you've got any value in that business, it can cost money for us to transfer that business into another legal entity. So when we're looking at um, what structure is the most appropriate structure for you, we think about some of these things. We think about the income splitting ability. So if you've got a business and it's just in your individual name, it's very difficult to split that income for tax purposes with spouses, partners, or future family members. You've got to also think about your asset protection. What other assets do you have? If you own your home in your personal name, then typically you don't want your business within your personal name because of risk. Legal liability usually brings in some sort of company within your structure. Now, it would be very rare these days that we did not have some sort of company within all legal structures, and that's because of legal liability. So what happens is, um, if you've got a company structure, so I'm just going to try and draw a couple of things here for you. If you've got a, a, a company structure, then what happens is that that company, um, that's not going to work for me, sorry. Um, that company is going to be a, that, that's going to be what we call a corporate veil. So what happens with a company is you have a company there um, and the company 
provide you with limited liability. And what that basically means is you can't look through the company to attack the individuals unless certain events happen. So those key events are typically when you've got um, someone who's acted negligently, when you owe the tax office, um, what we call PAYT withholding deducted from their wages um, and superannuation. There's also an instance what we call ins insolvent trading. Now insolvent trading is when you carry on business knowing you cannot pay your bills as and when they fall due. Now if you can't pay bills as and when they fall due, potentially if that company went broke, they can look through the company and they can try and recover the, 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 the lost money um, from the directors personally. So a company gives you the best legal protection you can from a legal liability perspective. The other thing a company adds um, is the ability to add additional equity holders. Another type of structure that you would think about um, when you've got unrelated parties in business together is a unit trust. Those two structures enable you to have defined interests within the entity that are carrying on big business. Um, there is another structure you consider, but they're the, most, the two most common ones. Exit strategy should also be a key consideration. How are you going to get out of this business? What's the plan? Is the plan to just operate this business forever and a day? Or is the plan to one day sell? Now, if that's the case, we should just think about how we're going to sell, how we're going to get out, because there could be different taxation consequences um, as a result of, of, of how you structure your business. Um, but additionally, there might be it might be easier to sell shares in a company, for example, than it is to sell a business from yourself as an individual. Tax obviously comes into the considerations with legal structures as well. Now, a company um, has a tax rate of 30%. Now, the individual tax rate at the moment is a maximum of 49% on income earned over $180,000. That's almost half of every dollar earned over $180,000 in your individual name is taxed at 49%. So typically with a company, we prefer to go into an environment where we know that the tax is just a flat 30%. It is on every dollar earned though. So typically if you earn more than $80,000, you'll definitely want to be in a company structure. As I said before though, you need to think about this up front. You need to get into that company structure ideally right from the beginning, because if you can do it right from the beginning, you won't need to move the business as it's grown into the company. When you do so, you could be hit up with some tax and capital gains tax consequences. One of the other considerations is that um, is the capital gains tax discounts. Now, I'm not sure if anybody owns any investment properties or anything, but if you own a business or an investment property for more than 12 months, you can halve the capital, you will only be taxed on half of the capital gain that you make on that business or on that venture. Now, that discount is only available to trusts and only available to individuals. So if you're in a company structure and you intend to sell your business, then you might need to structure it slightly differently if your plans are to build a big business and sell it out of the company. And normally I've got a blackboard when I, when I have these sort of discussions or a whiteboard and I, and I draw all over them. Um, but they're some of the key considerations. The other thing I would say is you have to look at your own personal circumstances. It has to be specific to you. Are you married? Do you have children? Um, but even if you don't now, will you in the future? Um, all those considerations come into place. The most common structure for carrying on business these days would be a company with shareholders of a discretionary trust. Now, a discretionary trust gives us flexibility as to how we distribute income um, and how we distribute capital gains, et cetera, et cetera. Um, another common structure is a unit trust, also owned by a discretionary trust. Um, they're probably the two most common structures for carrying on business, but if anyone has any specific questions about um, structures, I'm happy to take those um, later on or, or offline as well. One of the key things I mentioned when we talk about what is an appropriate structure is whether you've got additional equity holders or not. And whenever I'm talking about having additional equity holders within a business, I use what I call the bucket analogy. Now the bucket analogy is essentially saying that you've got a bucket and that's your bucket of profits. Whatever profits are in that bucket get distributed in accordance with the percentage of the shareholders. So if you've got a 50-50 business, then the profits will be distributed and must be distributed 50-50 um, and that will come out of the company, for example, by way of dividends. 
One of the key things though, when you've got unrelated parties in business together is that sometimes people are putting different things into the budget, so into the bucket. So sometimes people are putting in time, sometimes they're putting in an asset, sometimes they're putting in an existing business. Now, if you put something into the bucket in a disproportion to some one of your partners, then you should take something out of the bucket in a disproportion to one of the partners as well. So typically that might be someone's, you might have a silent partner within a business, and if that's the case, the person who's devoting 100% of their time to it should in theory get a wage out of the bucket. Now when that wage comes out, that reduces the profit, and then that reduced profit gets distributed in proportion to the shareholding. So I just make that point because I think it's really important that if you're going in business with someone else, that you think about these issues. If you don't, I've seen many of businesses fail because they haven't talked about some of these things up front in the beginning to make sure that um, the communication is all very transparent um, and that someone's not changed it because they think they're getting ripped off. So you think about your structure, but really what you're doing is you're starting with the end in mind, and that, that's my point about exit strategy. So hashtag long haul. Um, as much as you can, think about the end in mind. Now, things will change. It's like when you prepare a business plan, um, it'll change the next day as your ideas develop, as you test new ideas and as you test different strategies. But all we can do is encourage you to think about the end in mind and then see what happens um, from there. Um, now, if that suits everybody, um, I might come back to the first one. Okay, sorry, no, I will come back to those at the end if you don't mind, guys. The people behind the business matter too. And so what my point is there, yes, the people are so important from an engagement and value sort of point of view, etc. But if, especially if you're a family business, don't forget about yourself as well. I've seen many great businesses and great business ideas get up and running, but at some stage they lose their mojo. At some stage they start, a bit of negativity starts to creep in and maybe they get a bit of fatigue. Um, so one of my points here is just make sure that you take some time to think about the people within and behind the business. Make sure you do take some time out. Um, make sure you get a bit of a refresh. There's nothing like if you, if, you, if you feel you're losing a bit of mojo once you've worked hard for probably a couple of years and um, you, you take a bit of time out to refresh, reinvigorate, and, and maybe even reinvent your model because fresh eyes can um, can make a massive difference on that. That sort of ties in a little bit too in that in, into this next slide where you know we've built it, but but will they come? Now this slide here is actually a photo of um, my two twin boys out in the front yard and Easter holidays. They decided that they wanted to make some money, so they went out the front with a with a bucket and a stool and a piece of paper, and apparently they were going to do some busking. So one of them had the words and they were doing some rapping and I think the other one was, was providing some, some, some background tunes for it. Um, now they came back inside and they were very disheartened to, to know that they didn't make any money. So just because you have a, a great idea, just because you might have something that you want to offer to people, it doesn't necessarily mean um, that people will want it. So go into it with your eyes wide open. So make sure your business, you do put some planning in place for your business and make sure you do think about the different scenarios. That said, you've still probably sometimes just got to put your toe in the water. Don't wait for it to be perfect to launch. Um, that probably sounds like a bit of a, a double negative there. You need to have some validation of your model. You need to have as much validation as you can. But don't have it all perfect and then do this launch the next day and expect it all to just take off. You can start to talk to people. You can start to put your toe in the water. Um, and I know with my business, um, Business Depot, in the first instance, um, we didn't have our premises sorted, even though they were a, um, an integral part of our business. We put our toe in the water. We started to get the reaction to certain things. And we then adjusted our model accordingly. When you do do your validations, um, validation, usually that's by way of cash flow and profit projections. It's best to base them on your inputs, not your outputs. So again, if I use this scenario of a real estate agent, think about, well, how many phone calls do I need to make to get a listing? And then how many listings do I get to convert to a sale before they then turn into a settlement and turn into money into the money into the door? If you go back to those inputs, if you go back to those activities that you can understand, then it helps with the projection process and the budgeting process. 
The other thing which is really good, and the banks always like to see this as well, is that you do three-way projections. Now, what we mean by that is we mean you do a profit projection, you do a cash flow projection, and you also do a balance sheet projection because the banks like to see what your balance sheet is going to look like in, in a couple of years' time. So again, tied into that point of putting your toe in the water, um, fail fast. Now, this is a, a phrase, I suppose, that's been thrown around a lot lately, um, but it's so very true. If you're doing something and it's not working, refine it. Don't be too proud. Refine the model. Refine the proposition. Refine what it is or how you're saying it. Um, and just because you fail um, on one tiny component of the business doesn't mean you should fail on all of it. So don't wait for it to be perfect before you launch. Um, there's no excuses. Refine it as you go. Now, now there's an acronym that, that makes many small businesses um, cringe in their seat when they, when they receive a phone call from, from these guys, and that's the ATO. Now, I suppose when you, when you start to talk about the ATO and your compliance obligations with the ATO, when you form your entity, you, you need to do your different registrations. One of the heads up there is that it can take time to get all your registrations. So anyone who has formed a business, um, you'll know that it can take some time to get your ABN. You can't open a bank account until you ha have your ABN in the business day. You can't get your licenses if you need to get some sort of business license without your ABN. You can't sign franchise agreements or, or it's difficult to, to execute a franchise agreement without your ABN. So any advance warning or anything you can do in preparation to make that process less stressful, the better. So get your registrations right. Another thing to note with the ATO is what I said before, they have snuck into the legislation a special clause that allows them to recover superannuation for employees and to recover any PAYG withholding deducted from wages directly from the directors if it hasn't been paid by the business. So they've got to issue what we call a director penalty notice to get that. But it's a, a really important thing to just keep in mind, although the ATO can be quite flexible with, with um, payment arrangements, um, they've always got a bit of an upper hand with some of these obligations. Overall, though, from a tax office perspective, talk to them. Talk to them if you've got a problem, if you're going to be late with your payment, just talk to them and give them an arrangement. And typically we find if you communicate well with them, it's not a problem. With your tax records, it's all about substantiation. If in doubt, keep it. Um, there might be a reason you can claim it um, or ring your accountant, ring your advisor and get an answer on it. But if in doubt, keep it and the more substantiation, the better. Now the tax rates now, as I said before, the maximum tax rate is now 49%. Now that's because that's including the Medicare levy and it's also including the budget, the federal budget deficit levy as well. So that drops off, I think it is in another two years time. Um, but prior to that, the current tax rates, you pay nothing up to about $18,000. Then from 18 to 37, you pay 19%. From 37 to 80, you pay about 32%. And from 80 to 180, you pay about 37% plus 2% Medicare levy. So once you get into that top tax bracket, it really jumps up and it really can hurt. And that's why we like companies so much, not only from a legal liability perspective, but also for a tax planning perspective. If we can cap your tax at 30%, then that can be incredibly useful. The trusts within the structure also help with that because we have flexibility to distribute to, to mum and dad and the kids and those types of things, okay? Um, your compliance obligations won't go away, so just keep that in mind. Um, don't bury your head in the sand with compliance obligations. Now, I once walked into a business and the introductory comment to me was, we owe the tax office $1 million. And that, um, that was obviously a bit of a shock. And, and, and they said, should we be talking to you, John, or should we be talking to insolvency accountants? Should we be talking to somebody who winds us up? Um, we managed to actually be able to turn those around because the reason they were a million dollars behind was they'd spent all their money on growth. So they'd actually grown a million dollar asset. So we were lucky enough to be able to go to the bank, fund our way out of the taxation obligations. My point here, though, is don't bury your head in the sand on tax obligations. They won't go away. Talk to the tax office about them. Talk to your advisor and make sure you put a plan in place that you can meet. Because the other taxes that we talk about, I've already talked about the tax rates. Typically, if you've got a tax agent, your due date, if you're a business, will not be until either March or May the following year. 
So the year just ended, 30 June 2015, though the tax on that is typically not due until 31 March or, or 15 May next year. If you have losses in your early startup years, usually they can be offset against future gains. But sometimes, depending on your structure, um, they'll need to be in the same entity that incurs the gains. Once you start to fall into the tax system, you'll need to start paying PAYG instalments. Now, if anyone remembers the old, um, the old quarterly instalments, I think it was called PPS, but PAYG instalments is essentially um, a, a payment of your tax in advance. So once the tax office knows that you have a tax liability, then you have to make sure the tax office wants to get that in advance. Um, and that applies to companies and it also applies to individuals as well. Um, you can pay your PAYG instalments as a fixed quarterly amount or you can pay them as a percentage of your income. Now, if you choose to pay them as a percentage of your income, then it goes up and down depending on your activity. So that's usually a good way to go with a, um, with a business because that way you're not paying tax um, that's out of whack with the activity you're experiencing within your business. When you're very small, you'll only have to pay that every quarter. Um, sorry, you'll only have to pay that annually. But as you grow, um, that'll start to be a quarterly instalment. Now, this is where I always give everyone a heads up about what I call the double whammy of tax. Now, the double whammy of tax comes about when you lodge your first year's tax return or your first profitable year's tax return. If you lodge that in May, for example, and you pay the tax for the previous year in the same month, they can also then turn around and hit you with an instalment for the following year, so the year that the May period has fallen into. So you've got to watch out for that double whammy of tax. If you've got a deposit in your business, you've got to deduct the PAYG withholding. Um, typically, that will be on a monthly basis until you, be, sorry, that's on a quarterly basis until you become very big, and then you have to do it on a monthly basis. Um, you'll also have to prepare a business activity statement, and that's where you'll typically remit your PAYG withholding along with your goods and services tax. Now, with GST, GST, of course, is 10% of, of the 10% of the net. So if you've got $110 of something that you've spent, $10 so that is GST and the other 100 is the real cost. And that's the cost of the business. So the business will get back the GST on whatever costs they incur. It's pretty much on everything, a few exclusions around health, financial, and some of the basic foods and those types of things. But in business, it's pretty much on everything. Um, so when you're building a business and you're incurring costs to get the business up and running, um, you can usually get back 1 11th of everything that you spend. Now, typically, you'll remit GST to the tax office on a quarterly basis, but as you grow larger, you may have to do that on a monthly basis as well. So one of the tips here um, is the good old, if you're receiving GST, make sure you're providing for it. Okay, so typically what we will encourage people to do is set up a tax account where they park that 10% of GST every time they receive that over into a separate account. So when you go to pay your bags, you've always got some money that's available to do that. The other thing with GST when you first register is you might register on a cash basis, but you also have the option to register on a non-cash basis. So what that simply means is you remit GST when it's received, when you choose a cash basis, or you remit GST when it's invoiced to your client on a non-cash basis. So typically as you're growing, now you're eligible to remain on a cash basis up to $2 million worth of turnover. So if you're below $2 million, you might choose to be on a cash basis to make sure you don't have to pay anything to the tax office until you've at least received it from the tax office. Okay, a couple of other um, quick tax things for you. Um, as you provide benefits to your employees, you've got to worry about fringe benefits tax. It's basically a tax on providing fun things to your employees, um, plus things like motor vehicles, entertainment, if you provide any loans or gifts, those types of things. Now, when you provide a benefit, it's effectively taxed at the top marginal tax rate. Okay, so um, um, I've got here on the slide 46.5%, but it's actually 49% now. So um, I'll, I'll fix that up in the slides. Um, payroll tax also kicks in. Now, payroll tax, don't get that confused with PAYG withholding. Payroll tax is a tax on wages, super, and benefits paid. Um, it kicks in once your wages hit $1.1 million in Queensland. So maybe we, we talk about that. Um, when your business gets up to that, that next growth phase. Um, really important that if you're paying director's wages and you fall into payroll tax territory, you pretty much get rid of those director's wages straight away so you can save some money. So I said before about the double whammy of tax, make sure you know your tax timeline, make sure you know your quarterly instalments, make sure you know when your tax returns are due, make sure you know when your bases are due. 
you've got the money put aside, it won't be a problem. But know your tax timeline because there's nothing worse than getting a surprise tax bill. And let me tell you, there's nothing worse as an accountant telling someone they've got a tax bill that they didn't know was coming up. If we get back into some of the, the more, um, the more um, fundamental things of business and less about the tax, um, think about what the drivers of value are within your business. Now, what is the business that you're building and what will drive value? We often do valuations of businesses purely for the reason so that the owners can see what it is that is driving the value of their business. Now, the number one thing I, I would say that reduces the value of a business is the reliance on a key person within the business, usually the founder, usually the owner. Now, if you can reduce that reliance on that key person, you undoubtedly increase the value of your business because it is more transferable to somebody else. What else drives the value of your business though? Typically when we do values, it's all about what is the recurring income or in, in valuation speak, we talk about future maintainable earnings. And then we look at what are the risks and the opportunities to grow that business. And those things both come into mind to determine the fair market value of the business. Another thing that helps you track the profit drivers of your business is to always look at your profit and report on your profit by division, by segment, by product line, by location, or by whatever it is that segments your business. So if you've got, um, for example, Mike, I'll, I'll continue with the real estate example. If you've got a sales business and a property management business, you wanna make sure you can see what profit contribution is coming from the sales business and what's coming from the property management business. If you're importing goods and selling them, you might wanna group those products into different types of group goods. So if you've got a consumer good, you might categorize it into consumer. If you've got a wholesale good or a business good, you might categorize it into that. Whatever it is you, you do, look at your profit, that's a start, but look at it broken down into some sort of segments so that you can learn to read them and learn to see where the money's coming from. And that can really drive what I call business rhythm. You wanna get some rhythm in your business. Now rhythm captures how regularly do you get reports? How regularly do you sit down and have meetings with your fellow shareholders? What do you hold your team accountable for? And here I refer back to the Rockefeller habits. What do you ask people to focus on from a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, annual basis? If you can create that rhythm within your business, um, it's amazing how the business can just run itself. You get the culture right, you get the rhythm right, and it's amazing how that business can just go from strength to strength. Tied in with all of that as well is know your business formula. So your business formula is basically where we look at your business and we split it between fixed and variable expenses, okay? Fixed and variable expenses and fixed and variable income. Your business formula is if I've got X widgets, how much profit am I going to make out the bottom? What's my variable costs? What are my fixed costs? And that then leads into discussions around your break even. Now with new businesses, it's always good to do a break even analysis because essentially you've got some overheads or some costs which are pretty fixed. But your level of sales start from zero and they grow um, on, a, on a gradual rate. Those sales usually have some sort of variable expenses which obviously are in addition to the overheads. So you can see there obviously that you find your break even point where you've sold enough property to pay for both your variable expenses and your overheads. So that's where your break even point. I like to then, that's what we call your profit break even to be precise. I like to then do another break even calculation which I call the cash break even. And what the cash break even does is it would, it would add another layer on top here to allow for the fixed cash that you want to take out of the business. You might have school fees to pay, you might have a home mortgage to pay, you might have a pet to feed. You're gonna need some money to live on from day to day. So you add that on there as well, and that raises the, the line up even further, and that then becomes your cash break even within your business. So it's, it, your break even and your, and your business formula are very much aligned together. Because once you know that, you can focus on the one percenters. And the one percenters allow you to look at, what if I tweak that by one percent? What if I can get that person to sell 10 more widgets every month? What does that do for the bottom line? And see what the incremental profit is. Because typically what you want to do is once you've got your fixed cost, that's like your machine. And you want that machine to be able to handle as many widgets as you possibly can. One of the other things that often comes up is around risk. And, and I hear some horror stories about people losing a lot of money because people have, they've let people in and they've trusted them within their business. 
um, and and they've and they've lost um, they've, they've lost some of their business or some of the value within the business. There's some simple internal controls that you can set up within your business to enable you to minimise that risk. One of those is, and it's one that's probably hard when you're starting out, is the separation of duties. So if you've got the same people doing multiple roles within your business, then often it can be difficult to separate those duties because if you could separate them, it would require two people to get together to do something bad, okay? But in a small growing business, you may have to rely on some of the other internal controls to get things going. Limit cash handling, which is great in the modern, modern economy. You don't need to have as much cash around the place. Don't ignore the warning signs. If something doesn't feel right, investigate it. Set up some, some procedures and follow them. If you can have procedures and then you enforce other people to follow them, then that reduces the risk within your business. From an accounting perspective, do a structured month end close. Um, that means everybody typically has to close off and you can't go back and change prior periods. Simple but effective, document your procedures and your processes. Um, do your bank rec, seems basic, but from an accounting perspective, you must do your bank reconciliation regularly. Um, that is one of the best controls within your numbers. Um, also, just make sure you back up your IT system. Do a budget so you've got something to check to, so that if something out and doesn't feel right, there's usually a reason for it. Automate some of the processes. So we do a lot with Zero accounting system at the moment, as well as Mile. But Zero it imports the transactions from the bank account, so there's less opportunity for data entry um, or, or, or people to, to, to enter uh, or to manipulate the data. Um, timely preparation of accounts as well is another big one that just enables you to make sure you have strong internal controls and minimise the risk. Now, banks can be helpful when you do not need some type of equity on the line. So often I see people um, with some great business ideas and they want to get it up and running. They're so excited about it and we're excited for them as well. But typically you need to have some equity to get it up and running. And I suppose that leads into my next comment that cash is king. Um, Typically, you need to have some cash for your business and where you find that from. Maybe you find that cash from, a, from an equity backer or maybe you've got it available yourself or maybe the bank will lend it to you, secure it over another asset. Typically, you need some cash to get the business up and running. Of course, cash is king, um, but profit matters. Um, as you're operating and you're getting some rhythm within your business, it needs to be profitable. Otherwise, it's going to be a continual cash strain. Tied into that, don't forget your working capital. Now your working capital is the cash, the capital you need to have tied up in your business just to open the doors. So if you've got premises, typically it'll be enough to pay the rent and any of your staff. And the rule of thumb is always three months. But as your business grows, don't forget that that grows as well. Don't also forget that as you budget out the next 12 months, there can often be some lumps and bumps throughout the years. Now those lumps and bumps might be because of seasonal fluctuations. So forecast your 12 months in advance, be prepared for those seasonal fluctuations, for those highs and those lows, and you might need to have just a bit more money put aside to enable you to get through that. So cash is king, but in the same token, profits do not equal cash. So one of the most common questions I get asked is my P&L said I made a million dollars, but I don't have any cash in the bank. Why don't I have any cash in the bank? And the common answers to that is typically that the owner has taken some money out for maybe buying a boat, a car, or, or some sort of private drawings. Maybe there's some loan repayments that have to be made. So you've got to make profit, pay tax on the profit, and it's out of your after-tax profit that you can then meet your loan repayments. Um, other things, significant increases in your receivables. So if you're lending money to your customers, which is effectively what receivables are, so if you're if you're selling services or selling products to them on account, then if you increase that, they're effectively lending money from you. So that sucks the cash out of your business as well. Um, decreasing your creditors, paying down debts, paying down your prior year tax commitments as well. Or maybe you had to use any of the cash generated for capital improvements or new assets. Quite often I call this, this situation where the profit is saying one thing and there's nothing in the bank, um, that the balance sheet is unfairly impacting the perceived performance of the business. Because sometimes it's like the balance sheet raping and pillaging the PL. Tied into the comments around cash, you still got to remember though, spend money to make money, but let's validate it. Let's not gamble the money that we have. Um, you, you, you've got to act like a business, you've got to, you've got to think like a business, so you've got to take a bit of a long term view. Everyone is a business with your employees within the business, think like that, but make them think like they're a business now too. 
I always love the flight center model where you have um, everyone in flight center is treated like their own business and they have to justify their expenses, their costs and those types of things. Your systems though are your machine and like I said before, once you've got your machine, you want to squeeze as many widgets through there. So getting great processes, getting great systems enables you to be as effective as you possibly can. It enables you to get that leverage and enables you to get that growth as, as, as quick as you possibly can. One thing that I've been talking a lot about as people have been implementing change within their business is being change ready. Now change readiness is about as much about the individuals in the business as it is about anything else. Now being change ready requires you to consider is the change that you're implementing appropriate? Do the principals or the leaders support the change? Do they see the need for the change? Do they believe we're capable in implementing the change? And then last but not least, down the bottom there, we've got what's in it for me. Everyone has to have a what's in it for me when you're trying to implement change within your business. So that's everyone within the team. Why should they get on this change bandwagon, which quite often is a growth bandwagon as well? Because as your business grows, your focus will change too. And even though I said before, keep the end in mind, um, it will change along the way. And maybe sometimes you've just got to focus on the stepping stones that will enable you to get there. If I go back to the analogy of my boys out the front, the next weekend after they um, did the busking out the front, they, they went out and they were a bit more structured this time and they, um, they thought about, well, what are we going to do this time? And so they were a bit more conniving this time and they actually went with the model um, where they decided to sell some cupcakes out the front. And, of course, this was a very effective business model because they got mum to make the cupcakes, didn't cost them anything, we didn't charge them for the flour, et cetera, et cetera. And then mum got on Facebook and all the neighbours came over and bought a cupcake off them. So they made about $18, I think it was. So they, they, they changed their model. They went back and they thought about what would we have to do different. It's no different to any business. You try something, you try and validate it, and then ask yourself, what would we have to do different to make to improve the probability of success? When you then focus on the change that you want to implement or the growth that you want to implement, work on waves of change. One of the biggest things I see people do wrong is they try and do too much at once. You just work on waves, and I always work on top three. So what are the top three things for us to focus on in the next three or six months? And then you tick those off, and then you focus on the next most important things. It's much easier to manage than, than, than a list of 10 things to focus on. I talked about the growth matrix before. Um, that's just looking at when you're focusing on growth, where the opportunities may lie. But when you do that, your working capital requirements grow too. And so, so often, often the business will double in size, your working capital will double in size as well. So just keep that in mind, you need to leave some more cash behind. Another thing from a cultural perspective that I always harp on about is don't tolerate waste within your business. And when I talk about waste, I always talk about the seven deadly wastes. Overproduction, waiting, transporting, inappropriate processing, unnecessary inventory, unnecessary motion and defects. Now this is the Toyota seven deadly wastes. Now that's a manufacturing environment, but that applies to any business that you work in. What sort of waste do you have within your business? Even your business will have defects. You might be an online business, but what if somebody gets it wrong on the website? What if the order gets shipped in, in, incorrectly? Or what if, how long does it take to transport those goods? What if they transport it to the wrong place? Those types of things. Once you get your business up and running, if you then focus on reducing the waste, it'll improve the efficiency. Just going to a couple of my final points here now, guys, but passion is contagious and, and I love working with the entrepreneurial spirits. I love working with the small to medium business owners. And it's amazing how that passion is contagious. It's amazing how the passion that comes out of those small to medium business owners is contagious if you allow your employees and allow your team to get in. So, so, so use that energy to energise others. If you're setting up the business, you know, you need to ask yourself if you are not the leader, who is? So if you're the leader, make sure you act like the leader. You've got to remain the positive. You've got to be the champion of different causes and different things like that. So many people get into business um, because of financial reasons, but at the end of the day, um, if they're not the leader, then you've got to think about who should be the leader. As you go into business, one of the big things is you've got to have someone to ask the silly questions. So who is your Yoda? Have someone to go to and ask those ridiculous questions because they're probably not that ridiculous. Ask those questions up front as you're going. Don't leave them sitting in the back of your mind. Ask them as you're going so that you can get answers from them as quick as you can. 
or alternatively, a lot of businesses are setting up what we call an advisory board these days. Um, no harm keeping the bank in the loop too. Now, guys, as I wrap up and answer some of the questions on, that you've posted there, um, I thought I'd conclude with some of the buzzwords that, that I'm sort of seeing out there in business these days. Um, and they would be nimble. I love the word nimble with business at the moment. I mean, how do we make your business more nimble? Because nimble is you know, not only fast, but it's smart. Collaboration, I'm loving collaboration as a way to get a lean startup up and running. We don't have to do things the old way. We can find new ways to do things these days and we can collaborate with other businesses to do that. Micro, what I mean by that is just getting to the nitty gritty, getting to the niche um, and, and getting to a really specific service that you might be offering, but also getting people within the business focusing on the detail, whether it be the data or whatever it is. Better, I include that because better is better than more. Um, we don't just want more, more, more. We need to do things better, better, better. And if we keep focusing on doing things better, then your business is going to improve, your profitability is going to improve, culture is going to improve, and obviously the results will show. And last but not least, I couldn't, couldn't exclude this one because there's so much talk about disruption out there at the moment. Now, when I hear the word disruption, I actually think it's more about innovation. Disruption is possibly just some businesses coming to the end of their business life cycle. And so they are innovating. They are innovating to come up with a better way to deliver on a lot of the times a, a, an existing need. Uber, for example, is just existing on the need to go from A to B. Um, people will call Uber a disruptor, but all they are doing is delivering in a better way on a service that is already required. So before I wrap up um, and, um, and, and go and on a few things, one of the questions I've got here is, do you have any tips on being resilient with your business idea? I suppose that comes back to my points on, on validation. Get out there and talk to some people about it. Obviously, you've got to think about IP. Obviously, you've got to think about um, whether you know, you're, it's safe to share the information or your idea. But find some trusted parties. Try and find your yoga. Find some advisors that you can confidently share um, and throw around the idea with. Um, then when you get to validation, as I said before, three-way forecasts are, are, are absolutely critical. But also sit back, reflect, and go right from the beginning again. Why are we doing this? And then look at your sustainable competitive advantage. Is it different to somebody else? Um, and step through the, the cash flow projections as well. Another question there is, at what point do you need to give up on your business idea if it's not coming together? Um, that's probably a hard one for me to, me to answer because I know, I'm probably someone who never gives up. Um, but maybe if it's costing you money, then quite possibly um, you should be deferring it. Now, why I say that is um, I first had the idea of Business Depot, which has been up and running now for almost two years. Um, when I was, well, I told my wife about it on a beach in Positano in 2001, and that was many years ago. Um, but what you can do in the meantime is you can fish by the stream. You can throw the hook in and you can see what interest you get. You can test the little ideas, you can test little strategies along the way. Um, but if in doubt, again, I would say talk to your advisors and get your trusted, get your Yoda to give you some advice or to give you some help with that. Um, another question from David, as a sole trader with very small income from tutoring music lessons, what turnover do I need to make before I have to do a BAS and collect GST? So the, the threshold for GST is seventy. No, sorry, seventy-five thousand dollars. I think they may have just put that up to eighty thousand dollars, actually. But seventy-five thousand dollars. If you earn over seventy-five thousand um, dollars, you have to collect GST. Um, now, David, if you want to pop me an email, I'd be happy to um, to get back to you um, with a with a definitive answer there for you. Laura, I've recently started a virtual admin business which services fellow micro and small businesses. Can you provide some tips? on attracting clients. I'm quite passionate about the whole marketing and, and, and attracting clients. Um, I'm loving social media as a way to create brand awareness. Um, but go back to what I said before about being different. What is it that's your purple cow? What's your purple cow that makes you remarkable, that makes you um, stand out from the crowd? You then have to get through that brand awareness. You have to get people to, to identify um, with your business to enable them to find you, obviously. And I find social media as an, as an easy way to get content out there and get people aware of what you do. Now, the question here is what advice could you give to somebody looking to start a boutique real 
retail business, how do you even start to source suppliers? Yeah, that's a tough one. Not knowing what sort of retail business you're in, um, but I would start by going to different um, events where other business owners are. You would be surprised um, by how many people in the business community are happy to help others. At Business Depot, we have a group called The Collective, which are a heap of other consultants um, that provide marketing, HR, IT, and all other types of consulting. And we use that community as a way to source access to people we wouldn't otherwise be able to connect to. So if it's, it's a particular type of retail business, um, I'd just start talking to people. I'm happy to talk to people like us at Business Depot, um, Chamber of Commerce, different things like that. Um, I suppose the only thing I'd, I'd hesitate is if you find someone on Google, just make sure you test them out and make sure you check out their credentials before you start to, um, start to invest in them too much. Does anyone have any other questions they'd like to post? Otherwise, I think I'm probably um, out of time. So just, to, um, so just to wrap up, I thought I'd just mention that at Business Depot this year, we've been focusing on making it happen. There's a lot of businesses who have great ideas, um, and I'm not suggesting they're all talk, but a lot of businesses have great ideas, but they're struggling to actually implement them. So we've been focusing on this theme of make it happen. And since the start of the financial year, we've launched Project It. And Project It is all about how to make it happen within your business. Um, so within Project It, we, we look at what is your it? That's around your vision, etc. Why do you want it? Um, are you ready for it? Which is around change readiness. Do you really want it? That's our validation step. How do you make it happen? So that's where we share all our tips and tools that we use to, ha to help you make it happen. Um, then it's about implementing it. Um, before you then measure it with the KPIs, KPIs and then you sit back and you review and you go, is this it? So if anybody's interested in, in keeping up to date with any of the tools, tips, resources on that, um, we do a, a video every couple of weeks um, and we do a blog post every couple of weeks on each one of those steps. Finally, last but not least, I'll introduce you to some friends of mine that I often use to help people implement new strategies. Now this is courtesy of Glenn Capelli, but um, I call these guys the three Russian brothers and their cousin. And what we do with these guys is they help us determine what the next step in business should be. Now their names are more of, less of, rid of, and toss in. So the three brothers ask yourself in your business or even in your personal life, what do you need more of? What do you need less of? Most importantly, what do you need to get rid of to enable you to get more of those things? Are there any other strategies to just toss into the mix? Um, we've got some worksheets available on our website for the Three Russian Brothers, if, um, if that's of interest to anybody. Um, but guys, thank you for attending. Um, great to have you along. Um, my contact details are there, and um, we also will have a copy of our slides available on the website this afternoon at businessdepot.com.au forward slash learn.